Jesus again in reply spoke to the chief priests and the elders of the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants, saying, Tell those invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fattened cattle are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their cities. Then he said to his servants, The feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, into the main roads, and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they had found bad and good alike, and the hall was filled with guests. Hello and welcome to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast, and the invitation has been issued. But some got very smug with it. Some thought they were too busy for it. Some thought it wasn't that important. First of all, understand who his audience is. Our Lord is speaking to the Jews. And he's inviting them and using this parable about the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying that it's open to everybody. But you have to come. You have to come to me. And of course, we look at the Pharisees and we look at the scribes. They thought he was a madman. They thought he was crazy. As if I'm falling for this stuff. This man's deluded. You know what? I understand that. I understand that for a faithful Jew who had not yet recognized that that salvation event had come, that the Savior had come, then, yeah, I understand that. I've oftentimes thought about people who get involved in what we today call religious cults. Oftentimes thought, I had, I had a, a classmate from high school who got involved with some guy who said that he was a prophet, he was deaf in one ear, and heard God out of the other ear. And of course, you've always heard of these doomsday cults, these people who've read the book of Revelations, they know when the end of the world is coming, they've left everything. In this particular case, they moved into the foothills of the Ozarks and this guy was divorced and so he wanted his son to be there when the Lord came. So he kidnapped his child and brought him up to the Ozarks. He didn't care about his ex-wife. He wanted his son to be among the chosen. And you go, you serious? Yeah, happens all the time. And maybe many people here have had children or loved ones involved in a religious group or in a religious movement that we just think something's right, something not right here. You know, somebody's elevator is definitely not on the top floor. How do you believe this? How do you believe that? How do you believe the other thing? And for the Jewish people, in a certain sense, Jesus had to sound somewhat like that. You know, he was saying stuff like, rebuild this temple, and in three days, you know, I'll rebuild it. Destroy this temple, and I'll, I'll rebuild it in three days. And they go, huh? 
It took our ancestors hundreds of years, and you're going to rebuild this temple? They didn't know what he was talking about, you know. And then he's talking about God being my father, and I'm the only one who knows God, the one who comes from me. And you go, come on. You know, we look at Jonestown, Guyana, we look at David Koresh, we look at Warren Jeff. You know, we look at all these people and go, how do you fall for that stuff? And for the Jewish people, I understand how after centuries and centuries of their elders and their forefathers, I understand how they probably didn't think this invitation was a really big deal. The question is, and the reason why our Lord likens it to the kingdom of God is because the invitation is still on. The banquet is still happening. And we're still invited. But, what's our excuse? What's our excuse? He had not yet suffered, died, and risen from the dead. So I understand the Jews' hesitancy. I don't understand ours. I don't understand the people who say, yeah, I'm a believer. Yeah, I'm Catholic. Yeah, I'm Christian. Yeah, I believe. I just don't think you have to do this. Oh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That's the big battle cry of especially a lot of young people today. I'm spiritual, but I'm not really religious. Then that means you know everything you ought to know about God. There's nothing more that we can add to your knowledge and that you're going to create a God in your own image and likeness to fit into your life, to your lifestyle. And it doesn't matter what all that organized religion says. We're going to decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. We're going to decide for ourselves what we want to listen to and what we want to reject and what we, quote, feel comfortable with. And we will have religion on our own terms. There we go. One went to his farm. Another went to his business, and we'll fit him in when we're ready. We'll accept the invitation that we're ready. We'll interpret it the way we want to interpret it. I had this happen years ago. Years ago, I'm out in a small country parish, and there was no Catholic school around, so our children who went to the school of religion, they had three requirements. Requirements were that your children attend religion class. They participate. If there's a little assignment, which was never much of anything, they, you know, do the work. And that they go to church on Sunday. And beginning of the year, the parents got the letter and they got everything given to them and they knew what the requirements were. And we had these young kids, you know, one family, and of course, you know, they never went to church and they only occasionally came to class. And so if that was the case, then since you hadn't completed the requirements for this grade, next year you repeat the same grade. Well, these kids had to repeat it. The father calls me on the phone and I can't say everything that we said because it wasn't a pleasant conversation. He said, what's this stuff, he didn't say stuff, that my children have to go back to the same grade. And I said, well, you know, here's the deal. Your wife was at the meeting. You know, your children need to go to church. They need to come to class. They need to do their, their little homework. And he said, well, the kids go to the Baptist church sometime with their grandmother. I said, well, you know, we're not a Baptist Sunday school. We're a Catholic church. Your children have to go to a Catholic church every weekend. And then, and I'm talking like I'm talking now. He, who the... F, or you to tell me I got to bring my children to church. Excuse me? You mean Father Bai made up this law for this parish, for this church? He didn't feel like doing it. So 
Why do I have to do it? Why do I have to follow the laws of the church? Well, you know, when our Lord said, you're Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Those keys are the one that open the door. Those keys that unlock. Those keys are the ones that get us in. That's the purpose of the church. And the fact that this guy hadn't even finished high school, let alone knew all the laws of the church and all the ways of salvation. But nobody's going to tell me what to do. And then we have the other side of that. You know, I work hard all week. Sunday's my only day to go to church. The kids have ball games on Sunday. I never get to play golf if I don't play on Sunday. We've got this fishing camp. It's the only time we get to go there. One went to his farm. One went to his business. Bottom line is, one of them says, God, I'm not that impressed. I'm not that interested in your banquet. I'm not that interested in being there. And that challenge, that challenge today when, when people say, why do I have to go to church every week? To listen to me? <laughs> Not hardly. Not hardly. You know, my sermons are whatever. But you don't come for me. You come for the precious body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Body and, body and soul. Soul and divinity. And the understanding that I have the opportunity. And if you're Catholic and you don't get this, you don't understand the basic foundation. I have the opportunity to come and I can receive Jesus into me, body and blood, soul and divinity. Jesus actually comes in me. Jesus actually goes on with me. Jesus actually helps me as a better mother, father, son, daughter. Jesus goes to work with me. Jesus is in me. Hey, I got too much stuff to do. I don't have time for Jesus and his body and blood, soul and divinity to come to me. I got things I got to do. Don't you realize I'm busy? I think that's a lot more offensive than the Jewish people who had yet to understand that this truly was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. They did it out of lack of information. We who say we believe, we have the information, and we get too busy anyway. You better think about that. We'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. Thank you for joining us here at Closer Walk Catholic Communications. More than ever, we feel that there's a great need to offer an alternative voice to mainstream media. Oftentimes, the voices that we hear and the lessons that we learn in the morals of the story are immoral at best. The need for us to offer the gospel message with great clarity and great charity is greater than ever in today's society. So we thank you. We thank you for all the support you give us here. First of all, we need your prayerful support because without the gift of prayer, we do nothing. Without the gift of the Holy Spirit and God's grace, we do nothing. Secondly, we're donor driven. We need your support. We need your prayerful support. We need your financial support. Everything that you do for us, all money goes towards spreading the gospel message. Thank you for all that you do, and God bless you and keep you always. But then he said to his servants, the feast is ready, but those who are invited are not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found, good and bad alike, and the hall was filled with guests. Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. Okay. The chosen ones don't want to come. Go out there and invite anybody. Invite anybody you want. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. 
I don't care what their lifestyle is. I don't care what their past is. Invite them. Give them a chance. Let them show up. Hi. A lot of people get upset about that. Mm. All these people. All these people who don't belong in church. All these people who certainly aren't as holy as I am. All these people who I know darn good and well do this, do that, do the other thing. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge in all of our lives. First of all, that conversion process, it's a lot easier to convert someone who's well aware of their own sins than it is to convert someone who thinks they're as holy as they should be. I don't have any needs. I'm not that bad a person. I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other thing. Those are the ones that are hard to, to convince. When our Lord says, go out and invite the good and the bad alike, the good and the bad have to accept the invitation. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what your lifestyle is. I don't care what your morals were. Are you accepting the invitation? Are you willing to come back to God? One of the great tragedies that I find, and I, I do this, you know, I'm a parish priest. I, I, I do a lot of this. But people who don't think they're worthy of God's love because of what they've done. Where do you read that? Where do you read that in the Bible? Yeah, we, we heard earlier, oh yeah, he'll burn their cities. He'll destroy the wretched men. He won't destroy someone who's searching for him. And I think our, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has done a wonderful job of giving us the example of what it means to accept someone who is searching for God. Mother Teresa was, was so great with that. You know, so oftentimes the people that she ministered to you know, certainly weren't Catholic, certainly weren't Christian. But she saw this as another person made in the image and likeness of God and another way to glorify God, even if it was just cleaning out wounds or feeding someone who was starving and emaciated. She found that as another way to serve God. And it's that ability, first of all, in our own lives to look at people. Not what they do, what they believe in, what their politics are, what their sexual preferences are, what their daily habits are. We, we see that before we see anything. And more often than not, more often than, than not, we make a judgment about that. And we ju judge and we decide that these people are or are not worthy of our kindness, of our respect, of our invitation. Anyone made in the image and likeness of God is worthy of the invitation of God to the banquet of everlasting life. All of us are welcome. And when you go out into the highways and the byways and you invite everybody, they're welcome. They're welcome to come to God. I don't care what you are, where you've been, what you've done, what your past is, you're welcome to come back to God. I see that a lot of times in, in, in prison. I had a guy not long ago. Hey, you know, I was a bad puppy. I was crazy. I was violent. I was angry. I did a ton of drugs, a ton of drinking. I killed three men. I just hope. I just hope God will forgive me. Hey, man. You know, that statement, I just hope 
God will forgive me, is your salvation. It's not what you've done. It's what you desire to do in the sight of God. And as he comes to church, and as he prays very fervently, and as he tries every day to control that anger that was so much part of his life as a free man, it's his efforts. You don't think God's going to open that door? Absolutely. You know, I unfortunately have been on the receiving end of a violent crime with a family member. And forgiveness is very, very difficult. It absolutely is. And, and when I see people, you know, make this witness, you know, family statement to the, to the deceased and say, I hope you burn in hell for all eternity. You know who I'm worried about? I'm worried about the person who makes that statement. I really am. Uh, because whether or not that person burns in hell for all eternity, your loved one's not coming back to life. The rape is not being undone. The molestation is not being undone. The murder is not being brought back to life. But the hatred that comes, the hatred that fills us is what keeps oftentimes even people who profess to know God, who profess to love God, but they live with such anger and such hatred and such a desire for revenge. And, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. Who? I felt that way, so I know. I know. Uh, but it destroys people. It destroys life. It destroys our happiness. It destroys our sanity. It destroys the people around us who we love when we're that filled with hate and a desire for revenge. And so we're destroyed. And we're so busy hating, we miss the invitation to the banquet. And we've got to realize that the measure we measure with will be measured back to us. And all of us have, have made mistakes. All of us have hurt people in one, one form or fashion. Maybe not intentionally, but we've all done that. God forgive that we should ever be saddled with someone who says, I hope you burn in hell for what you've done and live with that all your life, that we have that, that type of anger. And so the question, the question about the invitation is, first of all, not to be so arrogant is to think we know exactly how to get there. You know, those who are too busy, those who go to their farm, those who go to their business, those who don't have time for it, even those who try to destroy the messenger, the people who continuously mock Christianity. And that's becoming very, very common in our society, in our American society today. There are a lot of people who continuously mock Christianity and think they're being cute and being politically incorrect doing all this stuff, but it's amazing. You can mock Christianity, you can take the Duck Dynasty guy, and you can make fun of him and want him off television and everything else. But for God's sakes, don't mock someone who might be a Muslim. For God's sakes, don't mo uh, mock someone who might be Jewish. For God's sakes, don't mock someone who might be homosexual. And for God's sakes, don't mock someone who might be black. That's not acceptable. Christianity, in particular, Catholicism, you can get away with it. It happens all the time on the networks. And there's no fallout from that. So Christianity is kind of fair game. And people mock us by killing the, the messenger. The servant he sent, they didn't like what he offered. They want to kill the servant. It's going on, people. It's going on everywhere around us. You know, so that's when our Lord says, it's open. The good and the bad of life. You've got to want to come to the banquet. And I hope the people who are out there trying to mock Christianity, trying to make fun of us, I hope they decide they want to come to the banquet. I hope between now and the time they meet God, they get to that point that they really want to know God. 
But that is what we live with today, and that's the challenge, is understanding what we need to do to be ready to go to the banquet. And the first thing is, accept the invitation as it comes. Go, go to the Word of God. Don't make up your own religion. Don't make up your own rules. Don't give, well, I changed religion because this is a better fit. What that means is, is I'm more comfortable having to make no changes in my life, and I feel better about my religious self because everything I do, no one challenges me. You know, the Lord issued the invitation and the challenge. And we need, we need to accept the challenge of being like Christ has called us to be and not trying to think we're going to fit God very comfortably in our lives and make him into our own image and likeness as we feel fit, as we feel comfortable. And then realizing that I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you've been, the door is open. The door is always open. God makes the invitation available. I can't tell you how many times in the last moments of life people have talked about their desire to see God, their sorrow for their past, and their hope that God will be merciful and forgiving. I can assure you of God's mercy and forgiveness. I can't instill in you a desire until you're willing to try to see God for who God is and not create God into who you are and make it all okay. That's the challenge of the banquet of the invitation. We thank you for being with us today and may each day bring you closer in your walk with the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for watching. For copies of today's program, please log on to closerwalkministries.com.